to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, hey, listen, I know you didn't come into this place to hear from a young man, an old man, white man, a dark man, uh, a man or a woman for that nature. You came to hear from God because I don't got nothing to say. So you didn't come to hear from me. You didn't come to hear from Pastor Dan, from Pastor Jim or Pastor Deborah. You came to hear from God. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer because the Lord knows I need it. You know, I know tonight's message is going to be good. Here's why. Because that punk sucker little devil tried to give me a sinus infection. And whenever he tries to get me down, I know God's going to show up and do something great and mighty. So, so I know it's going to be good. I just, I'm encouraged. I'm ready for it. I'm ready to hear it just as much as you are, so I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand, would you join me? Let's stand as we go before the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that we have the ability and the opportunity, the privilege and pleasure to come into the house of the Lord. God, your word says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Father, there we know is your presence, Lord. Your word says that when two or more are gathered, there you are in the midst of them. And Father, we thank you that you are here in this place tonight. We don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. God, we don't come to church for entertainment or tradition, but Lord, we come into this place to hear from you, and we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church, and so Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, to minister to us, to take the word of God that we read tonight and plant it, the seed of the word of God, into our hearts, into our lives. God, that we might leave this place and cultivate it and cause it to grow and bear much fruit in our lives. And Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us, your church. Lord, at no time do we think of ourselves as better than anybody else but as co-laborers all working together to build the kingdom of God. So, Father, the blessings that we ask upon ourselves, Lord, we thank you that you would bless all the churches across the world and the Inland Empire that are reaching and teaching people with the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Baptist and Presbyterian, Lutheran, Episcopalian brothers and sisters. Father, our Foursquare and Pentecostals and Charismatic brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank you for our local churches in the area, Harvest, The Grove, Sandals, Father, we thank you for the well, the way. God, we thank you for Ecclesia. Lord, for Emmanuel Baptist, for Trinity. Lord, all the churches around the Inland Empire, Lord, more than we can name tonight. Lord, we thank you that you would be with them this week as they preach and teach the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for our brothers and sisters in the Coachella Valley, South Riverside, and in Temecula, and in San Diego Coastal Hills. Father, we thank you that we've been blessed to, to send the word uh, and the DNA of the Rock Church and World Outreach Center all across Southern California to reach people for your glory and for your kingdom. And Father, to you be the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, amen. amen. Well, praise God. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. We're going to go to 1 Thessalonians in the third chapter tonight. I was reading, as I was reading through this week, I was, I was reading through some of the New Testament books, and this verse, this, this section of Scripture really stood out to me. One of the things I really love is the prayers of Paul the Apostle. There's some dynamic prayers in the book of Ephesians and Colossians, some prayers that I've prayed over myself and I speak over myself from the, from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit from Paul the Apostle. And here is three simple verses. As Paul is exhorting the church in Thessalonica... He exhorts them with this prayer in the third chapter. And tonight I want to look at some thoughts. I want to look at some, some details out of this prayer that will encourage you. I know that will strengthen you, that will better you. And you and I, if we can grab a hold of these things in our lives, I know that we'll leave this place encouraged, strengthened, prepared, ready to go out there and to do what God has called us to do. The title of tonight's message is God's Desire for You. God's Desire for You. Here, Paul the Apostle even though he's writing to the church in Thessalonica, you know, let me give you a little tidbit of history. Before there was the New Testament, before there was Bibles in the first century, second century, they would pass, the churches would pass around and copy the letters that the apostles would write. And so Thessalonica would send their letter to, Corinthian, or to, to Corinth, and Corinth would send theirs to Athens, and, and they would circulate around, and they would copy them, and the churches would read from the letters from the apostles. And so even though this is a prayer directed to a specific or a particular church, it was God's intent, God's design, through the preser preservation of the, whole, uh, of the Word of God by the Holy Spirit for thousands of years to be applied to you and I today. And even though these are the words of Paul, the apostle... One of the things that I love about Paul the Apostle is how, how instrumental Paul was 
at teaching and laying out the systematic doctrine of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus came and gave us the example to live by. He gave us the ultimate sacrifice through the cross. He showed us how to love. Now Paul comes along through the grace of God, through the will of God, through the plan and desires of God, and shows us and lays out the systematic doctrine, step by step, the foundations of our beliefs and our faiths and our trust in Jesus Christ. And so I love this, this, uh, um, this prayer that Paul teaches, or this, Paul, this prayer that Paul prays over the church. And tonight we're going to look at that and see God's desire in Paul's prayer for you and I, the church. So I had you turn to 1 Thessalonians in the third chapter. 1 Thessalonians in the third chapter, looking at verse number 11. This is uh, Paul's prayer to the church. And he says, Now may the God... And Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ. Interesting thought here. Interesting segue to this little little passage of scripture. Is that as Paul makes this prayer. Paul prays not only to God. But he also prays and lifts up the prayers to Jesus Christ. Because God is our Father in heaven. But Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And so Paul lifts up these prayers for the church. To both God and to Jesus. And he says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God. And Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. One of the things about the church in Thessalonica is that they begin to believe that the, that the second coming had already come. They begin to panic. They begin to wonder, did we miss out on Jesus Christ coming? Now, it's, it's funny that you and I have, have the movies and the books, the Left Behind series. And I know that there's probably been times, so listen, I'll be honest with you. There's been times when I woke up in my house and I couldn't find anybody. Everybody was downstairs or outside in the yard. I think, oh, my Lord, did the rapture happen? <laughs> and the church was concerned about that. And Paul's... Paul's exhortation through his prayer to them is that God would direct his way to them, that God would increase them, that God would abound in their love for one another, that, that God would establish them so that they could be, uh, to do a good work, to be found blameless when the time comes for Jesus Christ to return with all of his saints. That glorious day that we look for when the eastern sky splits and our Lord Jesus Christ comes. Whether or not the Lord tarries and we leave this place through natural death or we go with Jesus Christ. Either way we know that we have a future in store for us unlike anybody else. Let let that be a word of encouragement tonight. But God's desire for us. Now I want to look at some things that Paul talks about in this, these short three scriptures. You say, Pastor, look, I don't see very much in this. Well, this really, Paul lays out some desires of God through the will of God, through the utterance and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Bible tells us that the word of God was designed and written by the Holy Spirit using men as the vessels to write it. The word of God is inspired. So here, Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, lays out some thoughts about God's desire, God's want, God's will for our lives. So today we're going to look at some things. We're going to look at four things out of these three verses of God's desire for you and I, us. God's desire for you. Number one, for tonight, God's desire for you out of verse number 11 is guidance. God's desire for us is guidance. Guidance. Now, a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday morning, I talked about things that accompany salvation. One of those things that accompany salvation is identity. And identity comes a, a new understanding of who we are, a new, what I said is a purpose to live, a reason or direction to go. But I thank God each and every day that God's desire for me and God's desire for you is to have guidance in our life or to have direction in our lives. Look what it says again in verse number 11. Keep your thumb there, put your ribbon, because we're going to kind of bounce around a little bit and come back to 1 Thessalonians. But look what it says in verse number 11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. You see, Paul took on the paternal of these churches. He took on the father of these churches. He was the apostle, the planter, the one that, 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 that sowed the seed. 
And Paul's saying, listen, may God direct. I desire to come. I desire to find my way to you. And he says, may God direct our way. Now, one might ask, well, Pastor Luke, why not just go? If Paul the Apostle desires to go see the church, why not just go? Here's the reason. is because guidance relies upon dependence in God. You see, so Paul the Apostle lived a life that was guided, that was directed by God in every way. And so Paul was basically making the statement that I am so dependent on God in my life that I will only go where God tells me to go. I will only do what God tells me to do. I will only say what God tells me to say. So here Paul's request or Paul's prayer or Paul's hope and desire is that God would lead him to this church or bring him so that he could stay for a while and minister and strengthen and encourage and water the seed of the word of God in their lives. So guidance depends on God's dependence. Guidance relies on dependence on God. I love what Psalms 119 says. I'll just put it up on the overhead. Psalms 119 verse 105. We know this verse. It's very familiar to us. It says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I love how the Bible tells us that the steps of the righteous are what? Ordered of the Lord. You see, you and I can rest assured that when we depend on God, that God will guide us in our lives. So not only do we have a purpose for existence, not only do we have a reason to live, but you know what? We've got God, the creator God, God Almighty, the one who knows all, the one who is all, the one who is everywhere all at once, the only being or person that, can, that has that capability. We have God on our side ready to give us what we need when we ask. We have guidance from God. It is God's desire for us. It's not a biblical verse. Sometimes we think it's in the Bible because it sounds like it's biblical. But I love this. I love how people always tell me, Pastor Luke, the Bible says you ask not because you have not. Not in the Bible, but it sounds like it could be in the Bible. But Jesus says to us to ask, to seek, and to knock. And would not God, our Heavenly Father, give to us what we ask for? But you see, our guidance relies upon the dependence of God. Upon the dependence of God. I love how James tells us. James tells us that we ask and we don't receive because we ask amiss that we might spend it on our own selfish pleasures. You see, when we aren't dependent on God, we say, God, I need the answer. I need it now. I need it it my way. God, this is the situation. And God, I need you to answer it. I need you to make it look like it's going to do this and this and this and this and this and this. And this is my game plan for my life. God, make it happen. See, what happens is is we lose it because what we're doing is we're telling God how we want to live our lives rather than saying, God, I need you to tell me, like Paul said, how am I going to live my life? You see, because God does things the way God does things, not necessarily the way we do things. Remember what it says in Isaiah, that the Lord says that my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. You think Paul the Apostle, as he's writing this, was planning on the road to Damascus for Jesus Christ to appear to him as a bright light to knock him off his horse, to blind him, to show him his his wrong way so that God would bring him to a catalyst, to, to be the one to bring about change. You see, God guided each and every step. And if we allow and we submit to the Holy Spirit and allow him to operate and work in our lives, God will bring to us that guidance, those answers that we've been asking. Those, like that song said, I come to you, Lord, seeking answers to questions I don't understand. Guess what? The Bible tells us that God's desire for you and I is to have the questions we don't understand answered by the Holy Spirit. By God himself. So we can live a life understanding that God's desire is for us to have guidance in our lives. Look what God's promise to his people is. I had told you to put a ribbon in your, in, your, in your Bible in 1 Thessalonians. Go with me to the Old Testament in Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah. Let's go to the book of Isaiah. And here, Isaiah is encouraging the people of God. And I love what it says in Isaiah, the 42nd chapter. Remember we talked about God's ways not being our ways. God's thoughts not being our thoughts. Isaiah, the 42nd chapter, verse number 16. God says to his people, I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. 
The Bible talks all throughout the New Testament how we were blind, how we were lost, or how we were in darkness before we came to know Christ. But the glorious light of Jesus Christ shone upon us, and we come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior in our lives. If you haven't had that opportunity, we're going to give you that opportunity later on today. But the glorious light of Jesus Christ has come. Jesus is the light of the world. And now he says, I will show the blind, I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. I will lead them in paths they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked places straight. These things I will do for them and I will not forsake them. And God is telling his people that there is a time coming when a light will shine in darkness. There is a time coming when light will shine as darkness. And as the evidence of God through the guidance of God, we can see that God doesn't always do things the way we plan. God doesn't always do things the way that we desire. God doesn't always do things the way that we hope for. Why? Because 400 some years later, or uh, several hundred some years later, Jesus Christ, the baby, was born in Bethlehem, the light of the world, in a manger, the, the, the Savior of all mankind, not in this glorious and triumphant entry like we might have thought God coming to earth as man, but rather in the most humblest of forms. And now all of a sudden this way that they did not know, these paths that they have not known, this light that was in darkness, now all of a sudden this light is here and has been brought to us. I love how Jesus Christ tells us in John, the 10th chapter, that he is the shepherd, and that his sheep know his voice, and they follow him. You know, my, one of our dogs just had puppies, and it's, she had some puppies, and, and she, it's amazing, she looks to my wife. We were just laughing about this. Now, I think that because she's seen my wife, I don't know, I'm just speculating, but I think that because she's seen my wife come home with little puppies herself, babies, that she looks at her and kind of says, you know, you've been through this before, so I'm going to follow you. Like, literally, no matter where my wife goes, this dog is like Mary's little lamb that just wherever she would go. And it's like normally this dog, before she had puppies, would lay out in the other room, didn't want to be around anybody. She kind of did her own thing. And now listen, she won't leave my wife because she knows her voice and she follows her. She trusts her. She finds security in her. You see, Jesus Christ is our great shepherd. The 23rd Psalm tells us he leads us by, by, by still waters. He makes us lie down in green pastures. We should know the voice of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, in John the 10th chapter, Jesus says to those who argue against him, you're not of me because you don't know my voice. So we should know the voice of God because it is God's desire, it is God's will, it is God's plan for us to have guidance in our lives so that we can go to God and say, God, I don't understand. God, I need direction. God, I need answers. God, I need you to tell me, Lord, direct my path. Your, Lord, your word says, your word is a light unto my feet, a lamp unto my path. Lord, your word says that the steps of the righteous are ordered to the Lord. Lord, you said my sheep hear my voice and they know my name or they know my voice and they follow me. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking for direction. God, I'm asking for open doors. And the Bible tells us that it's God's will for us to have guidance in our lives. Thank God we don't have to walk around trying to figure out what am I here for? What is the answer to this or why this or why that? The fact of the matter is, is that God's on the throne. We, know, we, we can know everything we need to. I love how James says, it's always the verse I go to. If anyone lacks wisdom, what? Let him ask. We'll move on from there. Number two for today. God's desire for you out of verse number 12, 1 Thessalonians, the third chapter, is growth. Growth. God's desire for you is growth. His desire for you is increase. Look what it says in, in verse number 12 of the third chapter, 1 Thessalonians. And may the Lord make you increase. You see, it's not about growth on your own. He didn't say, may you increase. Did you get that? He said, may the Lord make you increase. Because growth isn't based on your ability. Growth isn't based on your comprehension. Growth isn't based on your education, your employment, your status, wherever it might be. Because if it was, then we would all be, all, all, we would all be out of luck. Thank God for the grace of God. The grace of God steps in God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. It says, I'm going to bring the word of God. I'm going to inspire the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And I'm going to lift you up 
to places that you didn't think you could go. Doesn't the Bible tell us that our God is a God exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think? It is God's desire for us to grow, not just to where we think we should go, but to where God desires us for us to go. Why? Because may the Lord make you increase. Praise God for growth. Our increase doesn't come from the world, from books. It does come from God. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Colossians, the first chapter. Colossians in the first chapter. Colossians in the first chapter. I love this. What an amazing book. I mean, Colossians is just like slap the devil in the face book. Paul again talking about his prayers for the church because of their, their faith, because of their belief. He says, for this reason, verse number 9, for this reason we also since the day we heard it do not cease to pray for you. Here's what they pray. And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You know what that means? doesn't matter what your IQ is. You know what that means? It doesn't matter if you even graduated from high school. You know what that means? It doesn't matter if you did anything with your SATs or not. You know what that means? It doesn't matter if you went to college. It doesn't matter if you got a PhD or an MD or an MBA or some other initial behind your name. You know what? All of that doesn't matter. Why? Because it says he asked that God would fill us with the knowledge of his will and the wisdom and spiritual understanding. We've talked for months out of the book of Hebrews about growth and maturity. We don't need to spend a lot of time talking about the maturity and how God's desire for us to, be, uh, to go towards perfection or to go towards completion. But he goes on to say that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. There it is again, increasing in the knowledge of God. God's desire for you and I is to grow continually in the things of God. Don't you love how when you operate in faith and when you work in faith, the next time your faith is tested, it's a little harder, and then it's a little harder, and then it's a little harder. It's like a big tree in the forest, those growth rings. Every time something happens, it's a new ring, it's a new age, it's a new year on your life spiritually. And now all of a sudden you become a great and grandier oak in the forest that the winds of life can't knock down. Why? Because you have grown in your knowledge and understanding of the things of God. God's desire for us is to, go, to grow. Our lack of growth is not because the word of God is hard to understand. Get this, church. Our lack of growth, we all go through seasons of highs and lows. We all go through wilderness times in our life where sometimes we're not where, where we ought to be, where we're, 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 we're kind of drawing back in the race. And our lack of growth is not because the word of God is hard to comprehend. It's because we lack in time spent with God. Think about it. Common sense tells us when we do something, when we apply something in our life, when we give time towards it, we grow in our understanding. I remember I had this, I, I used woodworking as an example. I had this little wood shop in my garage and I do little projects. Most of my projects are home fix or upper projects. And I remember there were times that, and there, listen, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'll be open, I'll be transparent with you. There have been times where I have made a project and I spent all my time, and I thought it was all great and all wonderful. And then I make one cut, and it's off, and I've taken that project, and I've thrown it, or I've burned it, or I've destroyed it. I've lost it. My wife, there's been times my wife's like, you shouldn't do this, Luke. You, you kind of scare me a little bit. And I remember there was this time when I was doing this, this, uh, this paneling in my daughter's room, and it was very complex. It was very tight fit. There was a lot of intricate pieces and parts, and it was all custom. I did it all on my own with my own tools and, and made all the profiles all by myself. And I remember I looked back at my wife, and I told my wife, I said, you know, it's amazing. It took me half the time I thought it would take, and I never once lost it. And she was like, she looked at me, and she said, babe, I'm so proud of you. You did so good. Yeah, I ran into pr problems. Yeah, I ran into issues and miscuts and things like that. But my knowledge had grown. My understanding had grown. And I said, okay, here's a problem. Let me fix it. Versus, here's a problem. Let me lose my temper and freak out. See, so common sense tells us that when we apply our time and understanding to something, that we grow in that. 
So it's not because the word of God is hard to understand. Yes, there are verses that are complex, but because they're inspired by the Holy Spirit to be written thousands of years ago, don't you know they're going to be inspired by the Holy Spirit to be translated and understood for you and I? But we've got to put the time, uh-oh, got to put the time and the effort into it so that we can grow in the things of the Lord. Look what 2 Peter says. Let me just put it up on the overhead. 2 Peter says, for this very reason, giving all diligence, there's that time, there's that effort, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Virtue, knowledge, verse number 6 goes on to say, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound in you, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter says that there are stepping stones. There are things to add to. Why? Through diligence. Yeah. And when these things abound in your life, when these things are plentiful in your life, hey, listen, God, the, the Apostle Paul said to me, the Lord, increase. You and I like when, it's, when increase means blessings. Well, don't you know that when we increase in our knowledge and understanding of God, we increase in our blessings of, of God. It's God's desire for us to continue to increase. You want blessings in your life? Go towards God. Spend time with God and watch how God will bless you as you grow. It is God's desire and plan for us. Number three. Number three for tonight. God's desire for you. God's desire for you. Number three, out of verse number 12, goodness. Goodness. God's desire for us, the church, is goodness. Goodness. We are to reflect Jesus Christ. Look what it says in verse number 12 of 1 Thessalonians. It says, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all. So listen, it doesn't just say abound in love to one another. Okay, Pastor Luke, I can love the church. I can love the people that I come to church with and that I sit next to because they're of like mind. They love Jesus Christ. But he says, and to all. It is God's desire for us to be a people of goodness. This last Sunday morning, Pastor Dan taught solely about love. I love the statement he said from Amy Carmichael that you can love without giving. No. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without give. You see, God's desire for us is to give of ourselves, to love one another. Jesus gave us the ultimate example of that. Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. That was in John. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Let's take a moment. This is a message entirely in itself. But let's look at this. How did Jesus love? Well, Jesus touched the untouchable. He touched the leper. Jesus went to the sick and maimed, the outcast, the demon possessed. He went to the social outcast. Jesus let the, the, uh, love the children, the immature, the ones that didn't have any society or didn't have any status in life. Jesus loved women. Now, girls, listen, I'm not trying to bring you down. Okay, let's understand that the times, the biblical times were different. All right, women had lived in different social times back in the day. They were, they were treated on an equal playing field as a servant or a slave. And yet Jesus loved them. Jesus loved the outsider. Jesus loved those who didn't nobody else want to be loved. And he says, this is my commandment, love as I have loved you. I've shown you the example, now go out there and do it. Not just to your brothers and sisters, not to just those who are in the body of Christ, but to all the world. It's God's desire for us to be the church, the goodness of Christ. There are so many things that we have done as a church in general, in the name of God, that have been so contrary to the ways of God and the thoughts of God. But God's desire for us is to be a reflection of Jesus Christ. Jesus said that he is the light of the world. But then he tells us that we are a light upon a hill. You see, so we are to reflect Jesus Christ through the goodness of God in our lives. Look what it says in James, the second chapter. James, the second chapter, starting in verse number two. Now see, Colossians was to slap the devil in the face book. James is a slap yourself in the face book. <laughs> James in the second chapter, verse number 14. What does a prophet, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, 
And one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. But you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? What does it profit? To say, oh, you're okay. I'll pray for you. He's saying, listen, there's some things you got to do in life. Now, the Bible clearly, this is something that sometimes preachers and churches kind of want to avoid is this faith and works discussion because there's, there's a road, a farm road. Just imagine a road, and on each side of the road is a big, deep ditch. And there's a, this, this road kind of applies to like a bunch of different things in the, in the gospel, in the word of God, grace, faith, things like that. And oftentimes we look at faith in one ditch and, and works in the other ditch. And we want to get into works and say, well, our works are what, what sanctifies us. And say, well, no, the Bible says that it's not our works, it's our faith. But look what James goes on to say, verse number 17. Thus, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, James, you have faith, but I have good deeds. You have faith, I'll have works. We'll split the difference. Show me your faith, he says without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You see what he said there? His faith, his belief, his persuasion. It's not, the works don't, uh, don't we don't get saved or not justified by our, by our works, but the Bible tells us that by the evidence of our faith, works will come. When we come alongside and we come into the family of God, the proof of our belief, not through our works, but our faith will be shown what, how? By our works. People will see us. You see, it's not just God's intent for us to come to church, hear the word of God, go to the workplace, go to the family, and be silent about what God has given us. We come to be equipped so that we can go out and equip those around us with the goodness of God. And it's God's intent for us to be a church that reflects the goodness of Jesus Christ. Wow! Last one for tonight. Let's, let's finish it with this thought. God's desire for you, out of verse 13 in 1 Thessalonians, God's desire for you, I use this word in order to be clever, in order to keep the theme with everything starting with a G, like Pastor Dan, try to make it all like poetic. I, I, I use this word. God's desire for you, number four today, is grounding. Now, not like your kids. Wait a minute, Pastor. Look, I ground my kids all the time. No, 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 no. Grounding, deeply rooted, establishing. God's desire for you is to be grounded in the things of God. I remember there was a time in my, in my house where I was setting up a little perimeter electric fence, you know, just one of those low voltage things. And part of the process of setting that up is I had to take this big four foot metal rod and I had to drive it four feet into the ground and then attach the wire to that so that it would disperse into the ground. It would be grounded. It was driven deep. Into the, into the earth. And God's intent, God's desire, his will for us is to be established, to be grounded, to have a root system based out of the word of God that goes deep into the foundations of Jesus Christ and holds firm when the storms of life come. Look what it goes on to say in verse 13 of the third chapter. That he may establish your hearts. Establish. Grounded. May he establish your hearts blameless in holiness before God. You see, when you are grounded in the things of God, you're not moving. Did you get that? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Sometimes we ping pong our relationships with God. All right, we, we, we go through, like James says, a wave tossed to and from. We're kind of bouncing around. Okay, I'm not quite sure where I stand on this. You see, a wave is not grounded. When you are grounded, when you are established, guess what happens? You don't move. And he says that you may be established in, in, in your hearts. Why? So that you would be blameless in holiness before God. As the deeper your root system grows, the deeper the righteousness of God comes upon you. Righteousness being right standing with God. And as that right standing with God comes in your life, the holiness of God comes upon you. And the storms of life, the questions of our faith, the attacks of the enemy, whatever it might be, 
would not sway us or turn us aside from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because God's desire for us is to be grounded, to be rooted. I love the, 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 the picture that Luke paints in Luke, the sixth chapter of Jesus, when he says people who hear his words and listen and do them. I love what he says. In Matthew, Jesus says, he who hears these words of mine and, and does them will be like a man who builds his house on the rock. But I love how Luke paints this additional slight picture. And it says in Luke, the sixth chapter, whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, Jesus says, I will show you who he's like. He is like a man building a house who not just built his house on the rock, but who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. Who dug deep. You know those great skyscrapers in the metropolitan cities. They don't just build them at ground level. They go deep, deep, deep into the ground. And their foundation is poured. And below the foundation are, pi are pillars that go into the bedrock of the earth. That are planted so that that building will not move. Have you ever seen a building get up and move? No. God's desire, God's intent is for us to hear the things of God, to hear the words of God, to hear the saying of God, to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, to read the word of God, to apply it to our life, and to develop a root system, a grounding in our lives, so that when the, life, uh, when the storms of life come, whether they be storms from the devil, storms from our family, hallelujah, storms from our job or our children or just life in general, we, like those buildings that are planted deep into the bedrock of the earth, will not be shaken, will not move. That we could be found blameless before God at the return of Jesus Christ with his saints. On that glorious day, we can stand tall because we have a deep root system. Yeah, the winds are going to blow. Yeah, the earth's going to shake. But you do not have to move. Look at what Paul exhorts Timothy in 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter, to exhort others. Paul commends Timothy to tell others in verse 17 of the sixth chapter of 1 Timothy. I'll just put it up on the overhead. Paul says, command those who are rich in this present age to not be haughty. Rich in this present age to not be haughty, not be prideful, to not be puffed up. Now, what are you talking about, Pastor Luke? You're talking about finances? No. But what happens is, you know, you've seen it. You've seen them TV shows about celebrities and stars. When you're rich in this present age, when you're rich into the things of the world, when you're successful and you're into that lifestyle, it's about possessions. It's about the house. It's about the cars. You wouldn't see somebody, some of these rich people in Beverly Hills driving Volkswagens. No, 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 no. They won't do that. Why? Because that's below them. Because they found themselves established in their image, in their identity. So Paul is exhorting Timothy to say to them, Command them who are rich in this present age to not be haughty, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives to us richly all things to enjoy. It doesn't matter if you've got wealth or not. God gives us richly all things to enjoy. But look what he goes on to say. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. God's desire for you is to be established, to be grounded, to be rich in good works. Praise God. Look what it says in verse number 19. Storing up for themselves a good foundation. Not a cracked foundation. Not a weak foundation. Not one built on sand. Not one built on circumstances. Not one built on a utopious experience, but rather to be built deep into the bedrock, into the foundations of Jesus Christ, storing up a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold of eternal life. God's desire for us to run this race well. God's desire for us is to endure to the end. God's desire for us is to not run as one, like Paul says, who beats the air or with uncertainty, but to run with a reason. That reason is Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in Ephesians, the second chapter, that Jesus Christ is our great cornerstone. He is the, the, the plumb line of our foundation, and upon that, the great foundation of Jesus Christ has been laid, and now we build on our lives upon that. God's intent, God's desire for us. Number one, this evening. God's desire for you and I is, I was going to say direction, I forgot. Guidance, see this G thing. God's direction for us 
is guidance. We can go to God and say, God, I need the answers. And listen, but understand, when you go to God and you ask God for answers, he may not give you the answer you want. Just remember that. Just remember that. Be careful what you ask for. Guidance. Number two, God's desire is growth to increase in the knowledge and the understanding of God, to grow in our understanding of the things of God. And as we grow, the Lord grows in us the blessings of the Lord in our lives. We live a fruitful, like Peter said, life. Number three for today, goodness. To reflect the love of Jesus Christ in our lives everywhere we go and everything we do. Last one for the, tonight is grounding. An establishment, a deep-rooted system based on the, on the foundation of Jesus Christ so that when life comes, we ain't going nowhere. And we're going to stand tall, stand firm until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, unless he tarries, or until we go to, the, uh, go to God in our own way. But hallelujah, we'll get there through the grace of God. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? Well, praise God. Hey, listen, thank you for those of you that remain seated and stayed in church. Thank you for honoring the Lord. Let me ask you to do one more thing. Just remain seated for just a few more moments. Let me ask you a very important question. Be a travesty for us today to come and to experience the presence of God in praise and worship, to hear the word of God and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and to not give you the opportunity to examine your heart and your life. You know, the Bible says that a man ought to examine himself from time to time. So let me ask you this question. Nobody will know this answer except you and God. But let me ask you this hypothetical question and let's see where your answer is. If you were to leave this place today and you were to die, heaven forbid, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a relatively simple question, but let's go over some of those answers that you might have had in your heart or your head. You know, you might say, Pastor Luke, I think I'm going to get to heaven. I hope I'm going to get to heaven. I want to go to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can think that you're going to get to heaven because you think you're going to go, you're going to get there? Nowhere does it say in the Word of God that because you hope or you desire to go to heaven that you're going to get there? Nowhere will you find in the Word of God that because you want to go to heaven that you'll get to heaven. That God will look at you and say, well, they wanted it bad enough, I'm going to let them in. No, no, no. It doesn't work like that. You know, you might say, well, you know, I wasn't raised as a Buddhist, a Hindu, or a Muslim or anything else like that, so I always just thought that by classification or by default, that I was going to go to heaven. Doesn't that mean I'm going to go to heaven? Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, a Hindu, or Muslim, or anything else like that, that by default you're going to get to heaven? You can't get to heaven by default. You can't scrape your way into heaven. It doesn't work that way. I love you enough. I respect you enough to tell you the truth. You can't get to heaven that way. You might have said, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I'm going to heaven because my parents told me I'm a Christian. Christians go to heaven. I went to Sunday school or Sabbath school class as a kid. I was baptized or christened as a baby. My parents took me to church on Christmas and on Easter. Here I am today. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you've called yourself a Christian or you've given yourself the title or because your parents have told you that you're a Christian? You know, one of the things that we like to do in our day and age is say, I'm a Christian, but I, and then fill it with whatever, whatever type of vice we want to follow it. The, the fact of the matter is you can't just give yourself a title or adopt a title because your parents told you and believe that you're going to get to heaven. You can't get to heaven because your parents told you you're a Christian. You can't get to heaven because you call yourself a Christian. That's like sitting in a garage Calling yourself a car. Ain't never going to be a car. You can't go to heaven because you were baptized or christened as a baby. It's not in the word of God. Don't go to heaven because you sit in church. Because you went to Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes. You can't get to heaven that way. You say, but Pastor, look, I'm a good person. I do good things. I've never robbed a 7-Eleven. I don't drive too fast on the roads. I give to charitable organizations. I've done more good in my life than I've done bad. Doesn't that mean I'm going to go to heaven? Good people go to heaven. Do you know nowhere in the Word of God does it say that good people go to heaven? As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God's righteousness, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get to heaven. We talked about that today. We're not saved by our works. We're saved by God. You might say, well, but Pastor Luke, I served in church. I was an usher or carried the pastor's Bible. I served in the children's ministry, the youth ministry. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? I was a leader. I have a member, uh, a membership card in my wallet to a church. Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you served in church, because you were a leader, because you carried the pastor's Bible, because you served in children's or youth, choir, anything like that, that you're going to get into heaven? Did you know nowhere in the Word of God does it say that St. Peter's standing at the gates of heaven waiting for your entrance into heaven because of your church membership card? I'm sorry, can't get to heaven that way. Jesus was speaking in the book of John in the third chapter to a religious leader of his day. My, a man by the name of Nicodemus. And Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus asked Jesus, 
How does one get into heaven? Well, tell me about this eternal life. And you would think that Jesus' response to Nicodemus would to be pat, to pat him on the back and to say, you just keep on going. Why? Let me tell you. Nicodemus, the Bible says, was of the Pharisees, the leader of the Jew. That means that Nicodemus was an educated man, that Nicodemus had dedicated his life to memorizing and studying the word of God. Nicodemus gave to the poor. He, he, he taught the word of God in his synagogue or in his church of his day. You would think that Jesus would say to a man like Nicodemus, well, you just keep going. You just keep doing what you're doing. You're going to get into heaven. But Jesus says to Nicodemus, this thing, this is God's way right here. Nicodemus, you must be born again. It's that simple. Hollywood popular culture, society's made a mockery out of that. You think of radical, crazy, weirdo, out of control Christianity. But let me tell you something. I don't care what Hollywood or popular culture or society's made out of that term. They have no concept of God. You can see by the fruit of their works. But from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, <clears throat> born again has always meant the same thing. Here it is. In the eyes of God, God's after all of your heart. Here it is. He's after all of your life. Everybody look at me, look at me, look at me. God's not after your mental ascent towards him. He's not after your carnal knowledge of who he is. You might say, well, Pastor Luke, I know who God is. I know the scriptures. That's okay. The devil in hell and the demons in hell know who God is. The Bible shows us that the devil quoted scriptures of Jesus Christ, yet they're not going to find their way into heaven because of their carnal knowledge of who God is. God's not after your carnal knowledge of who he is. God's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. Let me prove it to you in the Bible, the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. Jesus Christ speaking to the church, people like you and I, says to them, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. He says, because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Wow. Disgusting, rude, crude statement from the mouth of Jesus Christ. And what he is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me define it for you in terms of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Lukewarm simply means this. That you're a little bit up, you're a little bit down, a little bit in, a little bit out. Occasional church attendance, bouncing around from the world to God, not wholehearted for God, not wholehearted against God, doing some of your own thing, doing some of God's thing. Riding the fence right down the middle. Hey, you got too much of the world in you to really get into the things of God. You got too much of God in you to really get into the things of the world. And Jesus Christ says, if that's you, you're deceived in thinking you're going to make it into the kingdom of God. So then how do we get there? You say, Pastor Luke, I'm glad that you're doing this, but you find God your way, I'll find God my way, we'll all get there the same Praise God. Listen, that's like saying all roads lead to the moon. We can't do it your way. Let's not do it my way. We're not doing some well-meaning church committee or author's way. Let's do it God's way because it's God's heaven. The only way to get to God's heaven is God's way. All roads don't lead to the moon. Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. So let's not do it any other way but God's way today. Jesus Christ said that if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his Father. If you deny him before men, he'll deny you before his Father. So in a moment, here's what I want to do. I want to give you the opportunity to give your heart, to give your life to Jesus Christ, to ensure your place with God in heaven for eternity, leaving hell behind. And here's what I'm doing. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to smack my hand on my Bible, and I'm going to go three, just like that, real loud, real hard. In just a moment, I want to give you the opportunity. When I smack my hand on the Bible, bang, just like that. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to pop your hand up. We'll do it all together. We'll do it all at the same time. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to go forward in my relationship with Jesus Christ. Pastor Luke, I acknowledge that I want to give Jesus Christ all of my heart. I want to give him all my life. I want to make sure today, Pastor Luke, that I get into heaven, that I leave hell behind. Listen, I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. You might say, Pastor Luke, I'm going to be embarrassed if I put my hand up. The people I came with are going to know where I stand. I'm going to, I, I don't know if I can do that. Listen, you know what? You might be embarrassed. Yeah, get over it. Why? Because wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward for God in a warm, welcome, and loving place like the church? You see, the decision's yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way in. You have got to choose. You see, God has already done everything he could to ensure you get to heaven by giving for you his most valuable possession, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody mess, to hang on a cross, a spectacle for the world to see, to carry your sin and your shame. And in return, he wants all of your heart. He wants all of your life. So who should raise their hand in just a moment? If you've never given him your heart, you've never given him your life, in just a moment, if that's you, when I count to three, pop your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, you can put it right back down. Who should raise their hand? Maybe you're not sure. Maybe you did this as a kid. Don't leave this place today without making sure. Listen, that's a gamble on your eternal life. 
you can't afford to make. The Bible tells us that life is a vapor. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. Don't walk out of this place tonight without making sure. Who should raise their hand? Maybe you did this at a Billy Graham or a Harvest Crusade or another church, but you never really followed through, never really gave it the effort, the diligence that you read about tonight. If that's you today, pop your hand up so I can see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. And finally, who should raise their hands? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, if you've been running from God instead of to God, today, let's make it the day you go hot in your relationship for Jesus Christ and ensure your place in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, leaving hell behind. It was never designed for you. The decision is yours. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. If that's you, get ready. Today is the day of your salvation. Don't waste another moment. Get ready. Get your hands up. If you're watching online, wherever you're at, if you're watching outside or you hear the sound of my voice, stop what you're doing. And pop your hand up wherever you're at. Just a moment. Let's do this all together. Today is the day of your salvation. Don't go another moment without making sure today. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. Where are you at in this place today? You say, I want to give them all my heart. I want to give them all my life. I see you. One, two, three, four, five. I see you. Five wise people. You say, hey, listen, Pastor Luke, I don't know if I can. I didn't embarrass them. I didn't embarrass you. Where are you at in this place today? I got you guys there in the back. Uh, one in the family room. That's six. I see you right there. Six wise people. Oh, I know there's more than six of you in this place. Come on, you're saying, I wonder if I should. Seven, I see you back there. Seven wise people. You're saying, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. You know what? You've been saying this, man, I need, to get, I need to take this seriously. I need to get right. I need to really do this. Come on, if that's you in this place, quit playing games with God. Stop messing around and let's go forward in your relationship with God. Seven wise people. I didn't embarrass them. I'm not going to embarrass you. Anybody else? I got that hand right there. Seven wise people. Anybody else in this place today? Say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. Come on. This is your moment. Don't pass it up today. Eight, I see that hand back there. Eight wise people. Anybody else in the place today? Anybody else in the house tonight? You say, well, I, don't, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. Come on. Come on, you should. I know you're here. The Spirit of the Lord's on your heart right now. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. It's not me. It's God. God's tugging on your hearts right now. Come on, don't reject him. Don't ignore him. Go forward in your relationship and let's leave hell behind today forever and ever and ever and ever. Eight wise people. Anybody else in this place today? Where you at? Come on, if there's eight, you know there's ten. Where you at, number nine? Where are you at, number 10? You say, man, I wonder if this guy's ever going to shut up. Yep, I will when you do. There's nine. Come on, where are you at, number 10? I got you, my sister. Where are you at, number 10? There you are, number 10. Come on. Where are you at? You say, oh, look, at the Spirit of the Lord's moving on you. Now you're saying, come on. Let's finish this up. Where are you at? Anybody else in this place today? Anybody else in this place today? You want to give them all your heart. You want to give them all your life. Well, hey, praise God for 10 wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. For those of you that raised your hand, for those of you that should have raised your hand, listen, it's not too late. You don't get saved. Remember I said you said, I want to give him my heart. I want to give him my life. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. We want to pray with you. We want to get some stuff into your hands. If you're serious about this, listen, whether you're in the family rooms, grab all your stuff, get everything you got, whether you're in the family rooms from the front to the back. Listen, whether you're old or young, if you are serious about this, I want you in a moment as we stand to get your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend, get out of your seat. Get out of your chair and come and meet me here at the altar. And let's change destinies together. If you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand, come on, come and meet me up here at the altar. And let's change destinies together. Come on, wherever you're at. Family rooms from the front and the back. Come on, you come. You can come, come on. Amazing love. enough, I respect you enough to hold it up for you. Why? Because you don't get saved 
by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. Let us help you today. If you're serious about this today, come on. We will wait for you because you, listen, you need to hear this. You are important enough to know that we'll hold this whole service up for you so that you can make this decision. If that's you, wherever you're at, I don't know who you are, but if you raise your hand, Elijah's going to sing this song one more time, or if you should have raised your hand, it is not too late to get out of your seat, to get out of your chair and take this seriously today. If you can't walk forward for God in church, listen, let's think about this. How are you going to go forward for God in the world? If that's you in this place today, Elijah's going to sing that song. If that's you, you come forward, but we'll wait for you. Come on, you can come. Come on. Listen, 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 listen. You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Today's a good day, all right? Good day. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is like one of the coolest guys. He's going to take you right over there. Listen, I promise nothing weird goes on. Oh, I promise, okay? We only do that when Pastor Dan preaches. Okay, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to take you right over there into a room. He's going to pray with you. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. Okay, he's going to lead you in a prayer. He's going to give you some literature, some stuff to help you get strong, to read through real easy reading. Very easy to help you get strong in the ways of God. And then he's going to give you a friend. We give away friends here at the church. They're called spiritual personal trainers. Okay, you know, you go to the gym, you get strong, you get a personal trainer, make sure that you're not wasting your time on those machines you have no clue how to use. A spiritual personal trainer is a friend that somebody will come alongside of you teach you some things in the Word of God for five weeks to get you strong in the ways of God, to buy a cup of coffee before church, to get you strong in the ways of the Lord so that you don't go back to the life that you came from. So if you guys would just go to your left, my right, right over here with Pastor Joel. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.